standpoint for even going into negotiations. So here the key issues are, can the European Union, the G77, and China reach agreement on a package deal on what happens on the Kyoto side versus what happens on the LCA side going forward? And if they can reach agreement, will it be something that the United States can accept rather than try to block at the end of the day? The small island states and the least developed countries have tabled formal decision text uh, in the LCA working group on legal issues, but we understand we weren't in the room yesterday because it was an informal informal as opposed to an informal. Uh, we hear that that was blocked from being put into the amalgamated text that Chairman Reif Schneider put out this morning by the United States and some other countries. We're still trying to confirm exactly who said what and why, but uh, you'll see when you look at the LCA text those proposals, which were formally tabled, are not in that text. Uh, finally, on, on finance, this is the other big political issue, I think, here. Uh, it's clear that an agreement on the Green Climate Fund is possible. And you may have just heard the presidency is conducting informal consultations in a representative group of countries on that key issue, because that is clearly a deliverable that she wants and South Africa wants to have at the end of this meeting as a benchmark for progress. But it's clearly also linked to the other major issue of long-term finance. How are we going to ramp up finance towards the $100 billion commitment made in Copenhagen? And uh, there we understand the United States continues to have concerns about any other countries, developing countries, having any say about what developed countries do to meet that political commitment that was made in Copenhagen. So that's sort of the overall state of play. And let me now turn it over to Melanie to talk about the LULUCF loophole issue. Okay, thank you, Alden. Hello, everybody. So here in Durban, as you know, we were, uh, parties are working hard to conclude talks on the Kyoto Protocol um, in order that we can have a second commitment period. But in order to actually conclude those talks, they need to secure agreement on the rules that underpin the KP. Now, a very contentious issue here in Durban are the rules that underpin the uh, negotiations for forests and other land uses and how you control for emissions from those. Now, this is an area it's technically known as land use, land use change and forestry, or LULUCF, uh, with a crazy acronym. Now, forests and peatlands have the potential to be really significant stores um, of carbon and therefore have the potential to offer really significant mitigation potential. Um, however, you may have seen the UNEP report that was released just before the Durban negotiations began, which highlighted the size of some of the loopholes in the KP. And in particular, it revealed that lax LULUCF accounting rules could actually mean that 600 megatons of emissions annually go unaccounted for as a result of what partly responded to the Kyoto Protocol Chair's request to try and put forward compromise proposals and find some middle ground. Now, the proposal that they're putting forward might not be environmental NGOs' ultimate uh, proposal. We'd actually like to see all emissions from forestry and from logging, logging forests counted. However, what this does represent is a really welcome step forward as a compromise proposal and a move towards environmental integrity, because what this proposal does is actually caps the amount of free credits that countries can receive from logging their forests from the current proposals on the table. So negotiators have been working late into the night, both last night and the night before, to try and reduce the options on the table that ministers are going to have to decide on. But essentially, next week, ministers will be deciding whether or not they want to cement this loophole into the Kyoto Protocol and have those unaccounted emissions from forests. So they'll be deciding whether rich countries' forests and land will be part of the climate solution or whether they'll be part of the climate problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. Now I'll turn it over to Eva Filsmuller to talk about uh, the CDMCCS issue. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, in, in Cancun, parties decided to uh, allow carbon capture and storage stands for CCS in the Clean Development Mechanism, CDM. So we have the CCS and the CDM. Um, they are allowed to include it under the condition that um, critical issues such as liability and leakage be addressed and resolved. As we speak, the contact group on CCS is currently concluding its text and will present recommendations to SAPSTA plenary this afternoon. Um, we are very concerned about how the negotiations have been conducted over the last week because of the strong pressure by oil industry in OPEC countries, particularly the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, but also Brazil. The current text allows CCS enhanced oil recovery technology. Let me explain what that is. Um, 
The Wyburn oil field in Canada includes a CCS project. This project is expected to inject a net amount of 18 million tons of CO2 in order to recover additional 130 million barrels of oil over an anticipated lifetime of 25 years. Assuming this plant was a CDM project generating carbon credits for a price of 8 euro per credit and producing profits of 60 euros a barrel, this project would make 144 million euros from carbon credits, plus around 7.8 billion from the additional oil recovery. The Weyburn oil facility could yield an average profit of 445 euros per ton of CO2 if it was a CDM project. This example also makes clear that enhanced oil recovery does not need additional climate finance to, get up, to be viable. It's an essential requirement under the CDM to be additional. Um, moreover, for each ton of CO2 stored, three tons of CO2 get released into the atmosphere. But this issue is um, completely ignored in the current, pr currently proposed rules and the extra emissions are not accounted for. We are particularly concerned that there was little involvement of developing country delegations in the negotiations so far. It is important that all parties are aware of these critical issues, foremost the countries where these projects will potentially be located. Because of high costs, environmental and legal concerns and community oppositions, CCS is failing in reality and is increasingly being abandoned by industrialized countries. CDM financing should not be used to be on this risky and unproven technology. To include CCS in the CDM at this stage would create loopholes that would undermine climate mitigation efforts, pro prolonging fossil fuel use and damaging the integrity of the CDM. We urge parties to realize that these critical issues, particularly related to liability, monitoring and environmental impacts, have not yet been addressed, let alone resolved. Thank you very much. Thank I have additional information if anybody is interested. Thank you, Eva. Now we'll uh, finally hear from Lamine Njiai from Oxfam Senegal, who's going to talk about the message that those outside these halls are demanding that negotiators and ministers inside these halls address. Thank you very much, uh, Alden. I just came from, from the march. I have to get out from the march to come in and speak to, to you. But I want to uh, make sure that the, the, uh, the energy in the march can be transferred here in, this, in, the, in the ICC. Uh, civil society organization from Africa, from America, from Europe, and from Asia are all together trying to make sure that change will happen here in Durban. Um, it is very important that we, we uh, bear in mind that what they're trying to achieve is that they are being impacted in their daily life. That's the reason why they, they're here. Uh, I've met farmers from, from Kenya, across African caravan of hope that went through 10 uh, African countries, and they're all here, 300 people, farmers, women, youth, uh, to make sure with all the civil society organization that change will happen, not only in the negotiations, but in their daily life. That's the reason why they are here. They will, so by the time we probably finish this, uh, uh, this press conference, they should be not far from the ICC at the entrance. And you will meet uh, people who can tell you their stories, the African narrative, the Asian narrative, and the older narratives about climate change, and how climate change is impacting their daily life. What message do they have to provide you? I met, when I met with Paul Okongo from, from Kenya, he told me a beautiful story about the difference between climate variability and climate change. Actually, he was teaching me uh, what also probably the science is, is, has al already proven uh, that, that really the climate is, is uh, changing. So um, please make sure that you speak to, to one of them. And I'll be pleased also to answer to any of you. In some sections and very incomplete in others, such as the four bullets for one of the biggest political issues here on legal form. Countries and working groups of those countries can, uh, in terms of progress, but that's usually what you expect as the ministers are arriving and starting to grapple with the political issues. In terms of what we want, we clearly want an ambitious package out of here. 
We want the Kyoto Protocol to be continued in as many countries as possible to indicate, it, indicate they will stay in the Kyoto Protocol. We want a process to start to build on Kyoto and create a more comprehensive and ambitious regime with binding commitments for all countries based on equity and common but differentiated responsibility. We want a finance package which will give countries some certainty that the developed countries are moving towards meeting the commitments they made in Copenhagen. And most importantly, we want ambition to be scaled up to meet the two degree temperature target, not to be put off until 2020 or later, as my country and some others seem to prefer. Others want to say anything about the state of play on the text or no? Next question. Over here in the third row, gentleman in the blue shirt. Andres Martinez from Bloomberg News. Uh, what's your guys' reaction right now to uh, China's new position on them being willing to, 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 to sign a new agreement, a new legally binding agreement? Does this move the talks forward from a phase, you know, earlier in the week when it didn't seem like there, there was much movement? Does it give you a better sense of what's going to happen at the end of next week? I would actually suggest you talk to the Chinese delegation about that news report. First of all, it's not an entirely new position. China has said in the past that it would be willing to take on commitments post-2020 based on certain conditions. That article mentions some of those conditions, overall progress in the negotiations on other issues, and also the state of play of China's economy and development by 2020 in terms of what they're willing to put on the table. Um, it's also not clear that that was intended to signal that they will take their domestic commitments, which they already have in terms of a 40 to 45 percent intensity reduction in carbon by 2020, and put those on the table in a binding international legal agreement. I mean, that, the article is not, I think, saying that. So it's a nuanced article. It's a welcome signal, I think a constructive signal, to say that China recognizes its responsibility now as the world's largest emitter, an emitter whose emissions are still rapidly growing. Uh, to be part of an ambitious solution long term. But there are a number of, of hurdles to overcome, I think, before China is willing to put a specific ta a target on the table and put it in a binding international legal agreement. Does this move things forward? I mean, it would make it easier to discuss with the As I said, I, I, I think it's a constructive signal, but the devil is in the details, and, and I think uh, there's not agreement at this stage between China and the other developing countries in the EU. But I think they do understand each other better, and those, those discussions are continuing, and we hope that they will provide the basis for a political deal uh, by the end of the next week that can uh, give us a way forward here. Other questions? We have uh, five minutes left. I th thought I saw a hand farther back over on this side. Yes. Gentleman there. Thanks a lot. My name is Mosef Hassan from Senegal. It, it seems that uh, climate change gets only one, ling uh, one language, that's English. Climate change speaks only one language. I'm a French speaker. I come from so far from, 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 from Senegal. And even for technical questions, as exactly you were you, you, you speaking, we don't have capacity to, to, to get what, what, what you know. So if, if for like situations like this, maybe press conference, we could have translated to help us to, to understand all those that could be something. So... The solution I'm saying is, uh, our, my competitor is here, Mr. Lamin Jai. If in two minutes he could summarize the main communication you, 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 you serve for our understanding, uh, that will be something good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And unfortunately, we don't have translation available, but I, I believe Lamin would be available to talk with you and others that would like to have a French uh, discussion about any of the issues we've raised here. Um, and we can conduct, uh, we can conduct some, some press conferences in other languages if that would be useful to you next week based on the availability of slots. Um, and we could explore the, the feasibility of that. Do you have a point, Mel, on that? If you're interested in finding out more about the Land Use Change and Forestry in the Africa Group's proposal, we have a colleague who um, is a French-speaking African colleague who would also be able Yeah, uh, I'm Arnab from Down to Earth Magazine, India. Uh, my question was, uh, how would the market mechanisms play once uh, Kyoto Protocol's second commitment period is uh, forfeited? Yes, thanks. So your question was, how will the market mechanisms um, look in the post-Kyoto scenario? 
Yeah, I think, um, well, there's a couple of things to say, but maybe um, one of the most important developments at the moment is um, that um, certain countries are really um, insisting that um, the conditionality of the future of the CDM is um, bound to the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, um, especially ALBA countries. Um, Venezuela has made a point quite a couple of times. And... Um, um, this is an interesting development. We'll see how Japan will react to this, who, um, who is noticing now that this is really a red line from other countries, and if they want to have an advancement, probably there has to be some movement on this issue from a Japanese point of view. Um, there will be a, a, on this the development that we are seeing, and then, like in the afternoon, um, I think it's all in, up, up in the air, but the uh, second commitment period and um, binding pledges are definitely a red line for a majority of countries here. So I think... We'll see. Yeah, and I think on the overall issue of market mechanisms, they only make a lot of sense if you have legally binding commitments that give certainty and integrity to the carbon markets. I mean, if, if you're talking about voluntary pledges, such as the ones we had under the Rio Treaty before Kyoto entered into force, that wouldn't give markets and investors enough certainty to know that the value of those carbon credits and, and offsets was going to uh, be maintained. Um, so I, I think uh, this is a whole, the whole notion that you can move away from a legally binding regime and still keep some kind of market mechanisms in the mix. And in some ways, it's a bit of an oxymoron. And we need to understand exactly what Japan is thinking, for example, in, in terms of their bilateral offsetting mechanism. Why do they need it when they don't intend to have legally binding targets after 2012? This is a question they have yet to answer. I think we're uh, just about out of time, and we will be available to talk to any of you uh, again uh, outside the room. And just a reminder, there will be the Fossil of the Day presentation at the CAN booth in the Exhibit Center at 6 p.m. Uh, tonight. You are all invited to come to the NGO party on the new beach, not the nude beach, the new beach, uh, on the north part of Durban tonight, I believe starting at around 9 o'clock and ending whenever you want to leave. Thank you. <laughs>